Hi, I'm Will, and this video is about procedural generation in Unity. I'm going to walk you through how to randomly generate a dungeon map, and it's going to be based on the dungeons from games like The Legend of Zelda and The Binding of Isaac. To get started, we we'll want to think about how this is actually going to work. Our dungeon map is going to be made out of different rooms. These rooms can be imagined as fitting on a grid, even though not every space will be used. We're going to want to make a two-dimensional array that can hold data about these rooms. But what kind of array would we use for this? You may have made arrays for things like vector twos or ints, but in this case, we'll actually want to make our own room class. This can hold all the data we might need. We can hold references to multiple data types, and it can be added to in the future. Now it's time to get into Unity. Go into the project panel and create a new c -sharp script. Mine is going to be called Room. Note that this script does not inherit from Mono Behavior. Think of this class more like a container for data. This section is called a constructor, which is used to pass information into an instance when it's created, which will be convenient. We're storing a vector two for the position, an int to describe the type of room, and bools to say whether or not doors are in certain positions. Note that if you have many room types, you might want to use a character or string to store that data, but an int will do fine for the two room types we'll use in this tutorial. It's time to start our level generation script. Create a empty game object and put a script on it. Mine's going to be called level generation. We can start by defining how big the level is in room lengths. For my script, I'm treating these as half extents, so the actual size is double this. We'll also need to make a 2D array of rooms. Don't forget that comma in the brackets. It might seem a little odd to keep a vector 2 list of taken positions since that information is technically in the room array, but it'll be much easier to search if a position is taken using the contains method from a list. In the start function, I do a little math to make sure that there aren't more rooms than can fit in the grid. Then I call separate functions, one of which is the one we're about to create called create rooms. Let's break down this create rooms method. First, we'll set the room array to be the proper size. Remember that I'm using half extents here. It's time to make our first room. It seems best to put the starting point of the room at the center of the grid so that we'll have plenty of room to spread out in any direction. The center of the grid is just at grid size x and y. We have two values to fill in for that constructor we made earlier. We'll want the position at 0, 0 to make it at the center of the scene when we eventually draw the map. Note that this is an offset from the array values. If we had the starting room at 0, 0 in the array, we would only be able to make rooms to the right and bottom of the beginning room. For our example, the room type will be 1 to reference that this is the starting room. You can have room types for all kinds of things, but in this tutorial, it will only be normal rooms and one starting room. Let's go over the main loop of this algorithm. I'm going to go through the logic of this loop before breaking down the separate methods it's referencing. First, we're setting up a loop that will run once for each room we want to make. After that, we're doing a bit of math, which will determine some odds in a couple of lines. Then we're grabbing any valid position to spawn a room. This next part is designed to make the map more interestingly shaped, so it's up to your own interpretation of how it should be done. I noticed when first making this script that the rooms were very clumped together. This part will make it so that some rooms will clump, but others will branch out. The amount that it does this is determined by the magic numbers above the loop and how many rooms are left to create. They're listed as magic numbers, but in reality, it's just a bit of math. It's set up so that the farther we are into the loop, there's less of a chance that we'll attempt to branch out. For the times that we want to branch out, we just keep trying to find a new position that has only one neighbor that connects it. 
Now that we have our positions, it's time to add it to the array and take a position list. We just make sure to calculate the offset for the array while we create the room. We construct the room of our new position in a type of zero, which represents a normal room. If you're doing something more complicated with room types, I suggest you do that in a separate method, once the layout of the map is complete. That doesn't fit the scope of this tutorial though. Let's go over how we're grabbing new positions. We need to grab a valid position. For this algorithm, a valid position will be anyone that is adjacent to a room that already exists, since they all need to be connected. We're going to grab a random taken position from our list, then randomly select whether we're going up, down, left, or right. We will keep going through with a loop until the position is not already taken and make sure it's within our room's boundaries. The selective position method is just a slight modification of the previous one. Here, when we grab the starting position, we make sure we're grabbing one that only has one neighbor. This separate method is just meant to add to the branching effect when we want it. Finding the number of neighbors a given room has is actually fairly straightforward, but it is vital to the several parts of the script. We just start with an int at zero and increment it for each side that is contained within taken positions. We're almost ready to draw the map, but we need to know how these rooms connect to each other. Now that we have our full map, we can just go through each room and check where the rooms around it are located. This for loop nested in a for loop structure will allow us to check every position in the 2D array. If there's no room there, we'll continue to the next check in the loop. Otherwise, we'll check each of the cardinal directions to see if there's a room, while being careful to avoid numbers that don't fit in the array. With that done, it's time to draw our map. But first, we'll need to make game objects that will make up the map. For my map, I'm using 15 basic sprites and arranging them to fit the layout. Each sprite is 16 by 8 with a 1 pixel gutter that I can fill with the doors for that image. This way I have an image for every possible combination of the cardinal directions. Mine is white, so it can be easily colored however I want. I made a game object with a sprite renderer component and made a script on it called map sprite assigner. Here we will need references to the sprites so that we can assign them in the inspector. You can use an array for this if you want. It would be cleaner code, but also a little more confusing later, which is why I did it this way. We'll also need to have some variables that will be set from the room data and a couple colors for different room types. In start, we just set up a couple of things, then call other methods to keep things clean. In pick sprite, we have to do a really ugly if statement tree. It's more tedious than anything. If there are more options, I suggest generating an image at runtime, but this is probably the best way to do it when there's only 15 options. The pick color method is a bit of a relief after that last one. It just assigns the color of the sprite based on the type of room it is. There are other ways to do this if you want to have a lot more room types, but this fits our needs. The last thing to note about this script is that when you are assigning the color in the inspector, make sure you change the alpha value to make it opaque. For some reason, Unity defaults custom colors to transparent. If you miss this, you might have a totally working system that doesn't show anything because all the rooms are drawn transparent. Now we can finally draw our map. This is the final stretch. And this part is pretty painless. We make a method in the level generation script and just loop through every point in our room array. We grab the position of that room and multiply that by the size of our map sprite. Then we instantiate it and set its variables according to the room it represents. So now we can see that every time we start the level, we get a new randomly generated map. You can mess around with these variables to see what kind of different maps you'll get or even set them to public and change them in the inspector. Don't forget that the same data we're using to generate this map can be turned into a fully functional level. If you want me to go over how to do that in a future video, 
or you want any more information on how this works, let me know down in the comments. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss any tutorials. Thanks for following along. I'm trying out a new format for this tutorial, so let me know what you think. See you in the next video.